I was trying to invent from zero. And so in those kinds of conditions, it, it will take longer than you expect. It won't happen the way you expect it will. There will be constant roadblocks and impediments thrown in your way. And part of your success is dependent upon whether or not you have set for yourself the threshold of what you're willing to live with, what you're not willing to live with. You know, if you want to make it happen, then you have to be prepared to live with a lot. You are going to face a lot of challenges. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Handbook podcast, where we tell inspiring startup stories with practical takeaways for you, the listener. Today's guest is a pioneer of digital media. Whilst working at time, she saw the opportunity to create the first digital media publication called Blender way back in the 1990s. Whilst building this magazine, she created the first forms of digital advertising. She then went on to form her own digital marketing agency, again, one of the first of its kind where she helped companies to build digital assets in the late 1990s. She's worked with many companies over her career and has an amazing track record. So much so that IARPA designated her as one of only 150 super forecasters in the world. This means that she has consistently predicted different events to a high degree of accuracy. Now, in this podcast, you're going to learn about how to make better decisions to make those million dollar deals that you dream of. Hi, Regina. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Handbook. It's a pleasure to have you. Hey, Omar. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So we've put, talked before, and I know like your incredible background in terms of your forecasting history. And if we take it back to where it very started, which was at Blender Magazine, I believe, where it was one of the first ever digital magazines, and you sold digital ads to massive companies before it was a thing, before it was a trend. Can you talk about how you got into that business and the decisions you made in that arena? Sure. I think that any type of strategic foresight that you conduct and and, uh, what ultimately became manifested as Blender is no different, is really starting with a strong perception of the information sphere around you. And at that time, I was working for Time Incorporated, um, one of the largest uh, uh, journalistic uh, companies in the world. And so it became very clear to me when I was working there. So this was in 1990. So that's going back quite a, quite a long time. And only just six months before, Tim Berners-Lee had actually published his proposal for the World Wide Web. So I was a tech geek. I mean, I am a tech geek. So I was already aware of the the publication of the World Wide Web proposal. So I thought, well, this is just going to be a matter of time. And, you know, here I was sitting in this very analog environment, you know, a print environment. This is 1990. Uh, uh, people did not have computers at home. Uh, people didn't know what CD-ROMs were. But graphical browsers did not even exist. So, so, but I was working um, uh, within Time Incorporated in a traditional magazine environment where you would uh, close your magazine and then you take it to a physical printer. These massive, uh, you know, industrial factories on Seventh Avenue in Manhattan. Our art director at the time decided to move back to Europe. So we had an open position for it. And I thought, yeah, but why are we looking to hire a full-time art director uh, with that budget line when we could just cut the cost? And I mentioned to my editor, I said, listen, you know, Quark just came out. It's a publishing program that allows you to essentially do uh, what the printer does. But, you know, we can put together the galleys before we, you know, with much less... Uh, efforts. Uh, so it was already clear to me that digital publishing was already there in a very rudimentary form. It was just going to take some time before it would scale to something beyond what most people and certainly my bosses and colleagues, you know, at Time Incorporated, you know, this bastion of print journalism expected. So I sort of resolved in my head at that time. I I mean, in the end, my editor bought it. So I wound up becoming not only a reporter and writer, but also the art director uh, because I could, uh, because I could do it. And um, so while I was doing it, I I thought, you know, all of this is going to, all of this analog world is going to disappear. Those old factories on 7th Avenue, those old printing presses on 7th Avenue, they're all gone. You know, there, and I, when I would go there, 
with the galleys, you know, and, and hand them over at three in the morning. Uh, and I'd look at these old printers, you know, these were like big union men, you know, these brawny guys. And I just thought that th these are the last, you know, there are no young people, you know, in these presses, you know. And so I thought, well, there's no publication that's actually operating as a digital publication. I know uh, I know how to make one, I have the computer skills. I understand, you know, what would be required in order to pull it off. So uh, that's really what began to formulate in my head in 1990 is what became Blender f four years later. It took four years uh, because it took four years to get people to even believe that people would, A, have a computer in their house, B, want to read something on that computer, and C, have it become so ubiquitous, you know, that it justified uh, essentially an industry around it, one with advertising and subscriptions, et cetera. So that was very, very hard for the people around me to fathom. And it took me four years to get the financing. It, it would be fair to say that I encountered pretty much nothing but resistance. You know, people just did not believe that it was even possible uh, that 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 people would actually read something off of a screen. I, I think if anybody... Uh, is entering into the entrepreneurial world, the one thing that they always have to maintain is dogged persistence, <laughs> you know, and with the expectation that uh, to, to get to where you want to be, it's never going to look like what you expected it would look like at the end. And getting there would be the longest part of the journey. Yeah. And what's really interesting is with Entrepreneur's Handbook, we are a digital publication. So the work you did at Blender kind of sowed the seeds for what we are today and it's almost a full circle because we're now interviewing you what i find really interesting about this period as well is when you're trying to convince people and they didn't believe what do you think made that you you believe and you spot this opportunity even though nobody else could see it at the time like obviously with your super forecasting background what kind of um, signals did you see that helps you to be like this is it this is going to work this is the future. Well, the biggest signal was what I was already experiencing within my job at the time, which was, you know, I was working in a print world. And uh, in, 1990, in 1990, the 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 print industry, newspapers, magazines actually entered into one of the worst recessions that they had ever experienced. So all of these very old, venerable magazines, town and country, you know, magazines that had existed for, for even in some cases, 100 years. They were just dying. Why? Because there had been too much overinvestment in, in publishing in the 1980s. Everybody thought the way to get rich was to make a magazine. And because there was plenty of advertising money out there, some did. But that was a temporary thing. You know, it was very faddish. So the, the, the print industry was already starting to experience a bit of a downturn because the advertising pie is only so big. You can only chop that up into so many pieces. And so what I, you know, when I entered the workforce, you know, um, I was beginning to see, you know, all around me, you know, in real time, what was happening in the, in, in, in the, in the publishing industry, um, in the media industry. And, you know, I was reporting on the media industry. You know, this was what I was doing for uh, magazines like Media Week and Ad Week uh, was it was my job, you know, to actually analyze the business of media. And it was becoming increasingly clear that the functional work uh, that was being done by platoons of people. So, so what in uh, many industries is often referred to as physical plant, which you need, you know, in the 90s, which you needed to press newspapers, press magazines, press records, vinyl, all of that stuff referred to as physical plant, all of that was going to go away. Um, it was already starting to go away. And the weird thing is because it, it costs so much money and takes so much time to build up infrastructure. Uh, usually the decline starts before you've completely amortized <laughs> all of the expense and infrastructure required in order to complete your physical plant. So already, you know, I could see that there was going to be a knock-on effect, you know, here, and that what was happening in the physical world uh, around the, 
the financial dynamics of the media industry were fundamentally changing. And that was happening at a confluence point, at a nexus point where you were seeing technological changes. So digital publishing programs were ramping up. Um, You know, I think one of the biggest breakthroughs, which I think is often really not, um, it's never really mentioned. I, I don't think it gets enough credit, but I think when Mark Cantor built Macromedia, which was really the first plug and play coding environments, you know, to, to build digital media, digital content. And that came about in like 1990, 1991. And that's what enabled Macromedia Director. And that was what facilitated the creation of the first forms of digital content, specifically digital publishing, digital media. And so, I mean, although at that time that was called new media, you know, so now it's just called content, you know, but, but, uh, but that's how big the, 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 the silos and also just the credibility factor, right? You know, what was called new media was not considered credible until really at least 2000, 2001, right? So the nineties were a very interesting period because you have very distinct points at the start of the decade, in the middle of the decade, and at the end of the decade. That decade began, you know, with Tim Berners-Lee publishing the World Wide Web proposal. In 1995, you had the arrival of the first graphical browsers. And at the end of the decade, you had Napster, you know, and Napster kind of eroded that barrier uh, between the people who control the fortress of intellectual property you know, and the masses who can exploit it. I think that the 90s was really uh, an extraordinarily pivotal time, you know, for the things that people take for granted now. You know, the digital world that everybody's living in is a world that, you know, uh, certainly when when I was trying to build, you know, at that time, even late into the 90s, uh, it was still, what I was doing was still perceived as very esoteric and fringe, And uh, it wasn't until like around 97 that things began to accelerate a little faster around digital media. But even then, it was still considered a niche and uh, very much uh, marginal. And do you think part of the reason for that was the strong vested interest? Because like I said, if if you've spent a million dollars on building a printing press, then the last thing you want to accept is that it's the end of the line. And with all the people who were in power at the time, it was in their interest, I guess, for digital media not to take off. So when you're working at Time and I guess other companies of that similar size, maybe they didn't want to accept the future because it obviously meant a lot more competition for them. And that's what we've seen today, where there are obviously a few major publications that are still going today, but there's now so much more competition for those eyeballs. Whereas back in the 90s, you had a few limited options of the number of companies who were able to print nationwide or print worldwide. So that, like I said, that monopoly or oligopoly has just been broken up. And I guess I can see why some of the people in those companies wouldn't want to accelerate that. Even if they could get the early lead or be pioneers in it, they were still worried that by making that technology available or showing other people that's possible, they would increase their competition. And Blender did have massive advertisers, right? So I think I saw it had Nike and Calvin Klein and people like that. Well, that came much later after I, you know, after I had already left Blender. But in the beginning, to get advertisers was virtually impossible because people didn't know what a digital ad was. What what I had to do was, I mean, I was the editor in chief and you know, you have to understand that to produce this, you know, there were only 3 people involved essentially in this production. Now we talk about lean agile processes, but this was, you know, and and part of the thinking behind this, you know, when I was developing it was, you know, part of the reason why the magazine, you know, newspapers, magazines, you know, these physical plant-based industries, media industries are starting to, you know, shrink is because it's very expensive uh, to run them, you know, and if your advertising budgets are going down, then you need to find ways to economize you know, the, the actual structure. So I thought, well, you know, there is a way that you can make magazines lean and agile, and that is to make them digital. 
And, you know, if we're distributing the the effort between, you know, somebody who's working as the editor in chief, somebody who's working as the day to day art director and somebody who's basically just coding it all on the back end. That's a really efficient way, you know, to split up, you know, how you would put it together. And that's what we did. On the advertising side, you know, we didn't have any ad sales. Uh, you know, I mean, there was no such thing as digital ad sales back then, but it had to be done. And so, you know, I had to basically go back to my network. I mean, Blender would not have existed if it wasn't for my network. I basically had reached out to a good friend, uh, Ted Cohen, who at the time, uh, I mean, he's, he's quite a well-known luminary in the music industry, uh, not the least of which he was the road manager for the Sex Pistols and for Fleetwood Mac, you know, uh, but, but uh, so he's got some of the best stories in, in the world. But um, he was working for Philips uh, CD-ROM division, which at the time was the only real form of disc-based media, specifically CD-ROMs were the only ways in which digital media was actually produced and consumed, you know, up until basically 1995, really. So, so, um, so I knew Ted was at Philips and Philips was putting together a bunch of CD-ROM discs that they were trying to sell uh, using the Time Incorporated, Time Magazine, Life Magazine, using those licenses uh, and, and their branded content. So I said to Ted, listen, I have a CD-ROM magazine. You are trying to sell CD-ROM based books. You know, why don't I create some ads, you know, for your stuff and we put it on Blender and that becomes, you know, an example of an ad based on time, not space, the time and, and size, how many kilobytes. And back, back then we're talking kilobytes, you know, so, so that was a completely different way to think about advertising. And he went for it. And then the other advertising that we were able to get was from, uh, so at that time, because there were no graphical browsers, if you were using what would now be called the internet, you were probably using a Pipex baseline and using what was then known as a BBS, a bulletin board system. There was a bulletin board system. The only other, uh, there were only two other digital companies on the East Coast operating at that time. One was another CD-ROM art project called Blam, uh, run by Eric Swenson. And the other one uh, was this music-based BBS called SonicNet, which was started by two guys. And I thought, well, this is perfect. You know, this is about music. Blender covers music and pop culture. You know, let me talk to the the SonicNet guys uh, if we can create an ad. So that's what we did. First ads really were me badgering people that I knew you know, to experiment uh, with how do you create something which is designed to sell a client's products, uh, but not in terms of a print ad or television broadcast time uh, or radio broadcast time, but is measured in actual amount of digital bytes. And and that really was that 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 was how the first digital ads came to be. But it wasn't until about three or four years after Blender had begun, you know, that it was really an entity that was selling advertising. And by that point, it wasn't even a digital publication anymore. Blender had been essentially pushed back into a dig, uh, into a print state uh, by the person who was the original financier behind Blender. Quite a famous English media guy. He's, he's no longer alive. A guy named Felix Dennis. So he was the one who put the original money in. He was also the person who, after the first few issues, pushed me out because he wanted to have a guy in there as the editor. So there you go. After you left Blender, then you went on to, I know, work for different corporate careers as well. So you're in Liberty Global, I think. Was it Sony you were at as well? And then now you've shifted back to like your own businesses again. Was there anything in that in-between period? Most people in the music industry already knew me because before I started Blender, I had been working as a music editor. I was an editor at Spin Magazine. So so I already knew quite a lot of people in the music industry. And <clears throat> so they were all, and, and Blender would not also, again, Blender would not have been possible if it wasn't for those contacts in my network. Why? Because at that time, there were no rules uh, really, for how do you use music 
How do you use video in a digital environment? How, you know, for me to ask, hey, I've got this crazy magazine that you actually, it's a magazine, but it's not on paper. You have to have a computer to use it. Hey, and would Barry White like to talk to me for that? So uh, obviously uh, getting uh, certain acts was not going to be possible unless those people knew me and trusted me and knew that I was not going to put their artists in a difficult situation or an embarrassing situation. So, so again, you know, it was because of my contacts and uh, network, you know, that I was able to get the performers uh, that, you know, Alice Cooper, Barry White, uh, the Beasties, etc., Luscious Jackson. So uh, in being able to get the artists for the publication, you know, that, you know, that's what has the kind of knock on effect of it brings in potential advertisers. It, it, for, for, for me at that, you know, at that time, it was, um, it was very interesting because I was getting a lot of feedback from the people at the record label saying, we love blender, but can you do like a blender, but just for us, you know, just for Atlantic records or, you know, just for Geffen records or just after I was deposed at blender, I wound up uh, actually starting the, one of the first digital agencies called engine. It was a partnership with an existing advertising agency called RDA, Raz Decimo Associates in New York. They had a lot of video game clients. They had no record label clients. They had no, you know, other, you know, film clients, et cetera. So, so I thought, well, th- this actually could be a really interesting partnership where, you know, you need a digital agency to start building out digital media for your clients because they're going to ask for that. And also too, you know, the work that I do can extend to traditional advertising form of commercials, uh, you know, engine RDA was born. We actually wound up doing a lot of work at Engine. Um, you know, I, I think I hold the world's record for producing more enhanced CDs than anybody, which is sort of a weird badge of honor or badge of shame, I suppose. The enhanced CD codec was a, a sort of interim codec that Philips and Sony had put together in between database CD-ROMs and audio-based CD discs. That codec uh, needed testing. So so the Recording Industry Association of America had hired me basically to develop, you know, the original media for... We also did a lot of uh, traditional uh, advertising, like television commercials. And interestingly, I mean, one of the things that I was really proud of, we actually were one of the earliest brand vendors for Microsoft. Microsoft had just started its games division. This was even before the Xbox. Uh, this was when uh, they were essentially buying the Atari licenses. Um, you know, so they were putting out these like 10 discs, you know, 10 disc CD-ROM disc packages, which had everything from like Centipede and Destroyer, Defender and Space, uh, Space Invaders. You know, so they had the sort of classic uh, games packages they were looking for people to basically develop websites, uh, digital media, unconventional types of assets that hadn't been done before. So we were doing all of that for Microsoft and we were doing it for other companies like Panasonic and others, and as well as for record labels like Atlantic Records and Maverick Records and, and a, a host Sony and a host of others. Of all the interesting things that we did, um, one of the things that I was interested in the most was Microsoft had a game called Deadly Tide, and they were just starting to create an industry around PC-based gaming, essentially. And Deadly Tide was one of their big licenses in PC-based gaming. And so they thought, well, it has quite a cinematic premise, right? These, these sort of aliens under the sea. They thought, well, it'd be interesting to make a movie trailer ad but for a game, but make it feel like they're watching a trailer for a film. So I directed that for them and it won a bunch of awards, you know, for innovation and cinema and advertising and blah, blah, blah. So Engine was kind of the interim step, if you will, uh, before I, my work really started to expand with Sony, Sony wanted to uh, hire me, but this was after I was already working for what is now known as part of Liberty Global, but back then was called Cello Broadband. It was the first triple play broadband network in Europe. 
and certainly well before North America and South America and most of Asia. So it was an opportunity for me to basically take what I was doing in a physical plant kind of way, because you're still talking about physical discs, things that you can pop into hardware, bring it into a wireless world. So I started first uh, as an executive VP at Liberty Global in based in the Netherlands, you know, where I was basically helping to create the first hybrid content structures where there is an element of delivery either through interactive television or over an IP network plus some kind of physical environments. In some cases, it was a television program like Big Brother, you know, the first reality TV programs, you know, before people could text uh, and vote, you know, for Strictly Come Dancing or something. Yeah, I was the one basically forging those experiments, um, you know, because back then the networks were still not that fast. And and so there was still a, a, a lot of technical experimentation that had to be done uh, before we could make those, make the stuff that now is seems very quotidian to people today, um, you know, in 1999 and 2000, uh, these were still very much technical experiments. We were not sure that we would be able to get the kind of throughput that would be necessary in order to create an enhanced uh, experience. Uh, so, so a lot of my work was in the technical experimentation, as well as all of the intellectual property deal making and geopolitical uh, issues that had to come into play. So again, the strategic foresight and forecasting elements were a big part of that, was anticipating how the market was going to change at the technical level, you know, infrastructure, politics over radio frequency spectrum. So, so there were a lot of moving parts. Uh, so, so again, it was basically applying a, a sort of my way of thinking about how to anticipate things in the future and trying to make those manifest in real world environments, you know, real world problems that required solutions. If somebody today is trying to innovate and they're trying to come up with something new, but maybe they're not sure if it's going to work and it might take a bit of time to do that. What kind of things would you say that they should be looking at or keeping in mind to make sure that what they're doing is going to add value and that it's going to pay off? Because obviously the work you did in the past, you had to look at all these different aspects. If somebody was trying to do the same thing today in a different field, what would you, advice would you give them? Well, I think we, we touched uh, on it a bit uh, earlier in our conversation, where I think that persistence and patience are, are probably uppermost. Everything that I anticipated that would happen with Blender in terms of how it would work as a business uh, was, you know, completely uh, turned upside down. Even though I knew that it was viable as a business, you know, there are, again, many other moving parts that you cannot necessarily predict. Like, you know, is somebody going to screw you on a deal? Is somebody uh, going to, uh, you know, is, is a major advertiser going to fall out or suddenly appear. So, so there are lots of different, uh, you know, it, does the technology change? Um, you know, does your distribution partner, uh, uh, is your distribution partner viable, not viable? Uh, there were so many ifs uh, back then because, you know, I was literally creating it from zero. There was nothing that existed before it. So, so th there were no roadmaps. And, and so being able to extrapolate from a past base rate wasn't really available to me. So the typical types of statistical methods that I would use as a quantified forecaster today, you know, in terms of applying that, you know, from a strategic foresight perspective back then, in a lot of the stuff, if I'm doing geopolitical analysis or analysis around public health or et cetera, you know, there are base rates I can work with. You know, there's prior history that, that I'm able to use in order to be able to guide my, uh, to guide my analyses. In terms of building out something like Blender or Engine or all of the other stuff that I did with Liberty Global and Cello and Sony, no, you know, the, all of that was, I was trying to invent from zero. And so in those kinds of conditions, it, it will take longer than you expect. It won't happen the way you expect it will. 
there will be constant roadblocks and impediments thrown in your way. And part of your success is dependent upon whether or not you have set for yourself the threshold of what you're willing to live with, what you're not willing to live with. You know, if you want to make it happen, then you have to be prepared to live with a lot. You are going to face a lot of challenges, but, but that's what you have to sort of seal yourself up for. That's the bargain. All decision making is trade-offs, endless trade-offs. P- part of the process of, of working through a trade-off is, yeah, you have to know what you're willing to give up in order to get, you know, something on the other end. So, so I would say that those really are, uh, what's the trade-off you're willing to live with? I think especially now that, I mean, certainly back when I was starting Blender and even up until quite recently, nobody was really interested in mental health issues. Nobody was talking about, you know, and even now I think that there's still a culture, you know, there's still very much a culture of, uh, you know, have to look insanely busy and, uh, you know, mental, mental health is for wimps kind of attitude. I think that that is still very much true now in some circles, but it's also true that, that there is an increasing focus on that. And so I think that as an entrepreneur, I think that uh, when you are articulating what the trade-off you're willing to live with is, Back when I was starting Blender, that was not part of the trade-off I was thinking about. I think today it, it certainly is. And again, there are lots of demographic differences between what my generation would define as a trade-off versus what you know a millennial or a Generation Z cohort, h- how they would view the trade-offs. Completely different, I think. I think this is one of the questions which um, we've asked sometimes as well is, what do you think is more important? obsession or balance can you be successful as an entrepreneur if you have balance or do you need obsession i think obsession i think obsession is a word that doesn't have sufficient nuance i think that you can be obsessed with something but i think what that implies is a certain unhealthy the attachment you can be passionate about something and not have it veer towards obsession. I think that it's good to be passionate. I think that you do need passion uh, to be an entrepreneur. You really do need that. That that I think it's I think it's I think it's far more important to have passion than obsession. Um, but even within the context of passion, again, I think you have to be quite level headed about what you believe are the trade offs around that passion. You know, there are some things that you. I mean, even for myself, you know, there are some things that I'm just not willing to do, no matter how much I would want something to happen. You know, I think that I also, for the sake of my own sanity, uh, as well as, you know, just what what I think is reasonable and rational in a working environment, you know, I I think that, that, yeah, being very clear about what the trade-off is and where your boundaries are. Yeah, I think that that's the essence of what defines a good entrepreneurial approach. Yeah, and so it was, early, I think it was about 10 years ago now, right, when you did the super forecaster experiment and you were tested and like many other people were tested as well to see if they could get results that were better than expected in terms of forecasting like consistently. And I think I remember there's only about 150 people who passed that test and were given at the title of super forecaster. Do you think once you got that title, then that then shifted the way you thought about business and in terms of going more towards, I guess, a knowledge economy and sharing how other people can make better decisions and helping people make better decisions versus what you're doing before, which was more, I guess, the technical innovation yourself? Still trying to innovate and invent. My research partner and I are in the middle of uh, two National Science Foundation research grants around a concept that we developed called Human Forest um, that we developed essentially, uh, it was a, an accretion of ideas that, that he and I both have worked on together and separately in prior research that we've done over the last 10 years, you know, even going back to the time of the ACE program. The ACE, pro- ACE is the name of the research study program from which the um, the term super forecasters comes it was the research program uh, funded by the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, otherwise known as IARPA. That research environment really was focused around the deployment of decision science and statistical theory 
um, and uh, as well as geopolitical analysis, uh, analytic tradecraft. So all there, there were a variety of different elements that were incorporated into that, that original study. It was the success of that study, you know, that permitted uh, uh, further IARPA research programs that that Pavel and I both, uh, uh, Pavel, Pavel Tanasov is my research partner uh, in my U.S. based company called Pitho. So so he and I have been working on inventing and innovating uh, since that first program. And also, too, with the work that I do here in Europe with my European company, Sybil Inc., uh, whereas, yes, that I do uh, training work, so, so teaching other people how to be better in their decision-making and forecasting their strategic foresight. But even so, I still do research work. So, so there's definitely an element of, I'm not sure that as somebody who's been trying to invent new technical platforms to invent new products, invent new concepts, um, invent new ways of agglomerating information and making it available in an information economy. I, I, I think that that's always what I've been oriented towards, and I'm still doing it. The, the invention process is long, it's difficult. Training people is something where you can see a much more immediate impact. If the pendulum swings more for me in the trade-off side, you know, to, to focus my time more on seeing shorter term impact, you know, then, then uh, I would probably migrate more of my time towards that. But in essence, uh, a huge, you know, I would say it's pretty much split, you know, as, as it was before that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still doing the R&D side. So, so R&D is still a big part of my world. And, and, and probably always will be, you know, uh, unless I decide to join the Great Resignation. <laughs> so, I, I don't anticipate that. I mean, I, I have too much. I, you know, I, I, I've I worked in the corporate world for a very, very, very long time for some of the largest corporations in the world. How these things usually go is that you, you, you do that for a while, then you do your own thing. And then, you know, you find some kind of middle ground. There's going to be lots of entrepreneurs listening today who want to make better decisions. What things do you think that you often see entrepreneurs make or people in business make and it leads them to make poor decisions? What things should you avoid? One of the first and biggest mistakes is that they don't have a process, right? They're just winging it. They think that they have a system, but they don't really have a system. So that's mistake number one. Um, you know, you really should have a plan. <laughs> and most people, even when they think they have a plan, don't really have a plan. Even if it's, you know, they're using like a, like a lean business plan form and things like, yes, okay, that's a plan for your business plan, but it's not a plan or a strategy for anticipating how your decisions are going to generate outputs and what kinds of outputs are you expecting? So, so yeah, so for, first mistake is usually there's no high quality process or system used uh, in, in the decision-making environment. Uh, the second is uh, usually that people just don't know how to formulate the questions very well, right? If you're trying to come up with a solution, you know, what you're basically doing is you're trying to deliver some kind of an answer to a question, but most people begin with the answer and not the question. And so the question really should guide the answer. And that's the second mistake, you know, that I commonly see. To a great degree, I understand why this is a very common mistake, because there are plenty of funding uh, venues that are perfectly happy, you know, to entertain your answer without themselves asking the question as well. Uh, or they think that they're asking the question, but they're not really asking the right question. And and so and that is why we have, you know, a lot of money going into companies that should never have been funded in the first place. You know, you look at something like WeWork, you know, the debacle of WeWork. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think that at least now there's able management trying to push that back into a money making enterprise. The emperor has no clothes. Who's spotting that? Is it really so much so that people are so enamored, you know, with with the charisma factor that they're not asking the simple question of, does the world need another real estate investment trust, you know, when you have major cities with a lot of excess office space? Uh, is that really 
<clears throat> is that what the market wants? You know, which would have been the appropriate question. And, and is it a, a resilient business to start off with? You know, so so I think that that's a, a clear example of yeah. You know, I see a lot of businesses start and and they get the money and they still get the money. So. Uh, and that's the caprice, you know, of the world that we live in, right? Y y you might even still be asking the right questions. That sets up for the third bit, which is, yeah, be prepared to be persistent and patient, and 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 it will be a challenge no matter how much you prepare. So that that is definitely the, I think, the important takeaway for anybody who wants to become an entrepreneur. And another question we like to get from people is, is there a book that you recommend that all entrepreneurs should read? I think Tim Wu's The Master Switch is a is a really good book for people to understand the nature of platforms, especially from the legal perspective, uh, because so many people forget that there are the minute you start trafficking in bits and bytes, you're dealing with a border borderless world. And that means that you are opening yourself up for legal and geopolitical factors. You know, most people have absolutely no they never think about that stuff for somebody who's had to deal in, you know, uh, uh, the compliance, regulatory and legality issues involving any kind of intellectual property that's being passed from one region to another. Yeah, you better think that stuff through because you can have the most interesting plans in the world and they still won't happen. I mean, you know, at Sony, we were delivering something called press play, which was before Spotify before Pandora, before any of the music streaming services. Uh, Sony was, w myself and, and a couple of other people were involved in basically trying to create the first music streaming commercial service. You know, this is back in 1999, 2000. It was a response to Napster. Um, and in the end, you know, lots of, lots of executives with a lot of ideas for what they wanted it to be but we still couldn't get over, you know, just the basic realities of dealing with, you know, rights issues. Rights issues matter, you know, and in the end, they can either make or break, you know, what your great plan, you know, as great an idea as it might be, you know, even if you have the tech, it doesn't actually amount to much, you know, if the the legal isn't right, you know, if, if it's not a right environment for the legal side. You know, so so it's it's those kinds of things that, you know, are always really important for people to take into account. So Master Switch is a great book. I would say that um, uh, I think also it would be interested uh, to read the work of Mariana Mazzucasi, who is the Italian economist who writes about extraction economies, um, you know, because I suspect that many entrepreneurs are looking to build in the digital world as opposed to say, you know, uh, I want to start a business uh, selling scaffolds. You know, I think that anytime you're dealing with digital worlds, it's important to understand what does it mean to be a digital business? you know, what, what's involved, you know, and again, part of this goes back to legal issues. And I think that it, it, it always flummoxed me back 20 years ago when we were think, trying to think through the privacy issues, the data issues. I mean, I wrote an article called The Encryption Imperative back in 1998, you know, and it was also the subject of a, of a quite well-known debate uh, that, that I was involved in with this was at the Amer this was at the annual meeting of the American Society of Newspaper Editors back in 1997. So I was on a dais with uh, the editors of major newspapers like the Atlanta Journal Constitution and others, and the head of one of the founders of America Online and others. And you know there were still people arguing that well you know we don't have to worry about privacy you know we're big giant brands giant brands will stay forever. And I just thought, on what basis are you making that assumption? You know, so, and when we start talking about things in the tech world, understanding, you know, how an extractive environment um, it kind of comes along with that world to some degree, but understanding that really deeply so that you can build responsibly, I think is it's a pretty good way to go. So, so that, 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 would be, that would be another recommendation I would add. Thanks, Eugene. That was really insightful conversation. Where can people hear more about 
your work and your startups. Thank you so much for for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. One of the easiest ways that people can reach me is through my personal website. Um, that that's at uh, www dot super rj uh, all one word super and my initials rj dot com they can also reach me uh, uh, either of my uh, uh, my company websites uh, www dot sibilink dot com or www dot pitho dot io uh, and I'd be more than I'm also on Twitter as at super forecast r letter r but but I'm very uh, happy to uh, uh, to receive any inquiries from people at those uh, at those addresses. Mm-hmm.